Well, thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm delighted to tell you about a brand new effort and based on my long time in the field, I think this is a historic event that you're witnessing. So uh, we're announcing this effort that has uh, researchers both from academia and industry around trying to do something about benchmarking. Uh, and we've got contributors from these five organizations, three universities, three industry firms, and the highlighted people, lots, almost 20 people participated, and the ones that are underlined are going to speak to you today in a tag team effort. So my job is to set the stage, so let me go over 40 years of benchmarking in computer architecture. In the 1970, the way we did that was we could guess how fast a computer was by just looking at the basic instructions and about their average time, and we would calculate how many instructions per second are MIPS, millions of instructions per second. Uh, that didn't work all that well because it mattered which program you run, not just the average instructions. And so the next iteration to try and improve benchmarking was to make synthetic programs that were supposed to be typical of the workload, called whetstones and dry stones. Well, one of the problems there, because it wasn't a real program, it was just a pretend program, is if you turned on an optimizing compiler, it would throw most of that code away. So the solution was, you're not allowed to use an optimizing compiler. So that's not such a great idea, because in computer architecture, compilers play this vital role. The next step to make a small program was to use these toy programs, like our great programming assignments, like 50 or 100 lines, and those weren't representative of real workloads, again, measured MIPS, and then for Floating point ones, you would instead of use MIPS, you'd use millions of floating point operations per second. But again, that didn't work very well. And in fact, to try and shift the industry away from these bad benchmarks, uh, and John Hennessy and I did this computer architecture textbook in 1990, and to try and point out the mistakes, we had a bunch of fallacies in our textbook. And the first fallacy was peak performance doesn't predict real performance. This industry today, right now, when we talk about new hardware, we talk about peak performance still, which is disappointing. We pointed out that MIPS, it doesn't <laughs> predict performance. MIPS is an instruction rate, and you can have something that has a high MIPS rate, but takes longer to run a program. Uh, the synthetic programs don't work well. They're, 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 they were an interesting idea, but they failed. So programs like dry stones, no one should use those. And that megaflops, uh, has the same problem of MIPS. It's a rate, and you could have a high rate, but take longer to run programs. And so if we go back 30 years in computer architecture, this was the state of the world. What did that mean for people trying to buy and sell hardware? Well, the, the Unix marketplace was just happening about risk processors, and a salesman would go to a customer and say, well, my computer is really a 10 MIPS computer, but those other guys who are coming to talk to you, they don't, they're lying. And so nobody bought anything because you couldn't believe any of, the, uh, any of the vendors. The reaction of that uh, was remarkably for these competing organizations, you know, HP, DEC, MIPS, Sun Microsystem that competed fiercely in the marketplace to create a cooperative to create a standard set of benchmarks so we could agree how to measure performance. So this happened 30 years ago, and that first iteration had 10 programs, four integer and four floating point. You would figure out how much faster your machine was than the machine of that era, the VAX 11780, and then you'd calculate the geometric, geometric mean of that ratio so that bigger was better. How many times faster are you than the VAX 11780 overall or for the integer programs or the floating point programs? So what was the impact of that? First of all, it settled the arguments in the marketplace. So you would go and say, here's my fast, how fast mine was, and you wouldn't argue about performance, and, but you could say maybe for cost or functionality, why mine's better. So the Unix market grew rather than arguing with it. It had a big impact inside each of these companies is because they could decide where the engineering efforts should go. They didn't have to argument that led to better investments. Uh, the initial cooperative, many people wanted to join, so they turned it into a corporation with more than 20 members. They decided universities were important, so they kept the cost low, so universities participate. And what happened is spec became the standard for everybody, the marketplace, papers, and textbooks. Now, to keep it active, both because computers were getting faster and because people could over-engineer efforts around spec, Every few years, they would revise the list. And this 
figure, uh, which is a little bit hard to, it was hard to read, is the history of spec over six generations. So there's 82 benchmarks in that list. Three-fourths of them only lasted a single iteration. Three of integer and three floating pan lasted more than three. But basically, you had to refresh the list all the time to keep it up to date and to make it grow to keep up with the faster computers. The net net of all of this is CPU performance had this renaissance period of growing by a factor of 1.6 every year for 15 years. That's doubling every 18 months. So that was a huge benefit. In contrast to spec, we have the embassy effort for embedded computing, which started about 10 years later. It was a nonprofit like spec, but it was very expensive to join. Uh, to preserve the income, they restricted access to it, so universities couldn't afford to participate, so they couldn't use it in their papers. And it seemed to be more focused on making sure they could make money rather than you know, creating a benchmark that would be good for the field. They had quality uh, problems with those benchmarks, maybe because of the lack of other people's participating, and more or less it was abandoned today. So, tw uh, 20 years ago they tried to do that, they didn't come up with a benchmark. What's the consequence to the embedded community? They are still using dry stone. <laughs> Shockingly, the thing that Hennessy and I said was a terrible idea in 1990, they still today, and if you design an embedded computer, you worry about this silly program dry stone, how fast it runs. So, here we are in machine learning, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna agree on benchmarks, or are we gonna file an embassy and end up with terrible benchmarks? So what we're announcing today is MLPerf, uh, you know, spec for ML. We're gonna try and do a cooperative where we try and get great benchmarks uh, to accelerate our field. That's our first goal, a fair and useful comparison to accelerate progress in machine learning. We want to, like spec, serve both the commercial needs and the research needs. Uh, we want to enable these fair comparisons, but even more than what spec want to do, we also want to accelerate progress in machine learning. Like spec, to get be sure we believe the results, that they're reliable, we're going to make them replicable, that we can recreate the results, make sure everything's there so we can do that so that the results are believable. And like spec, we're trying to keep it affordable so not only industry but universities can afford to do this. Uh, and we're following the plan of agile benchmark development. What does that mean? That means we're going to rapidly integrate, in, iterate sorry, the benchmarks like spec did, but even faster. One reason is machine learning is moving a lot faster than the Unix marketplace is, so to keep up with machine learning, we're gonna to have to change the, those programs even faster. Secondly, we'll certainly make mistakes, just like Spec did, is leaving some loopholes that will lead to misleading performance, so we're gonna to have to correct those. And finally, ML hardware is getting faster every year, and it, the data sets that work today are gonna to be trivial in just a couple of years, so we're gonna to have to operate that way. So my guess is we're going to iterate every year, not every few years like, like Spec did. And, but like Spec, we'll have like a quarterly deadline and publish all the results every, every quarter via searchable data space. Okay, I have set the stage. Now my colleague, Professor Wei from Harvard, is going to tell you about the benchmark selection. <laughs> 